Good evening. I'm Ellen Armour, and I am the professor and carpenter chair of feminist theology and the associate dean for academic affairs here at Vanderbilt Divinity School. And I am delighted to welcome you to the 50th annual Antoinette Brown Lecture. 50th annual, think about it. This lecture series was launched in 1974 with the help of funds made available to the Vanderbilt Divinity School by Ms. Sylvia Sanders Kelly, who was a graduate of the College of Arts and Sciences, actually, in 54. And she's from Atlanta, Georgia. The lectureship is intended to bring distinguished women theologians and church leaders to the Vanderbilt Divinity School to speak on a variety of concerns that are relevant to women in ministry. It's named for Antoinette Brown Blackwell, who in 1853 became the first ordained woman in America. A graduate of Oberlin College, Reverend Blackwell carried on a Christian ministry for many years prior to being officially recognized through ordination. She was active in all aspects of the women's movement, among other social movements of her day, throughout her life and actually shared many public platforms with Susan B. Anthony and Julia Ward Howe, among others. Previous Antoinette Brown lecturers include Rosemary Radford Ruther, Sally McFaig, Rita Nakashima Brock, Ada Maria Isazi Diaz, Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, Sharon Welch, Katie Geneva Cannon, Letty Russell, I'm not done, <laughs> Diana Eck, Renita Weems, Kwok Puilan, Susan Thistlethwaite, Mary C. Churchill, Stephanie Paulsell, Laurel Schneider, Monica Coleman, Talithia Nikki Young, Amy Jill Levine, Ebony Marshall Terman, Lloyda Martell, and Kelly Brown Douglas, among others. As is our usual practice, we'll have a few minutes following tonight's lecture for Q&A, but you are also invited to continue the conversation at the reception that will follow this lecture. The reception will not be in this building, as it usually is, so just giving you a heads up, but in the second floor gallery of the library. And in honor of this auspicious occasion, the 50th anniversary, the Divinity Library staff has curated a special exhibit celebrating 50 years of the Antoinette Brown Lectures that will open after tonight's lecture. And I want to thank Matt, our beloved Matt, for, <laughs> for making this possible. So please plan to join us in the gallery for the opening and for the reception. I'm sure there'll be fabulous food, and obviously I can't wait to see what the exhibit is. That's going to be very cool. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce this year's lecturer, Dr. Grace Y. Gao. Dr. Gao is Professor of Ethics and Sano Chair in Pacific and Asian American Theology at Claremont School of Theology. She's a founding co-director of Claremont Center for Sexuality, Gender, and Religion. Dr. Gao was also the first Asian American woman to receive tenure at that institution and later promoted to full professor. She's won two teaching awards, I will notice, too, at that institution, so obviously we're experiencing a great distinguished colleague here tonight. She is the author or co-editor of four books, including her most recent, My Body, Their Baby, A Progressive Christian Vision for Surrogacy, which was published by Stanford University in 2023. In addition to teaching and keeping an active speaking schedule, Dr. Gauss currently serves as an associate editor of the Journal of Religious Ethics, and as a board member in two Asian Pacific Islander scholarly organizations, the Pacific, Asian, and North American Asian Women in Theology and Ministry Network, and the Asian Pacific American Religion Research Initiative. She is the daughter of Taiwanese immigrants 
and a lay member of the Presbyterian Church USA who shares a home with her spouse, two biracial sons, and one pandemic cat. <laughs> the title of her lecture is Can Surrogacy Be Feminist? How About Christian? Welcome, Dr. Gao. It's truly an honor to be here tonight. I'm seeing friends in this room that I haven't seen for a bit. I'm seeing people, colleagues of mine that I see on occasion at academic conferences. I'm meeting some people for the first time. We had a lovely luncheon today where I learned more about uh, the person whose lecture this is um, named after. The, so. Uh, let me just say that when Dean Emily Towns issued the invitation several years ago, I was deeply, deeply honored. And here it is. <laughs> the time has come. So I'd like to begin um, with two personal anecdotes um, in reverse chronological order that are adapted from my recent book on surrogacy. So anecdote number one. It was very late one fall evening. I had already been in the hospital for 36 hours and counting after having been admitted for a medically indicated induction. My husband had stationed himself behind my head, gently whispering reassurance. He could sense my alarm at how much my body was involuntarily shivering and shaking from the epidural, IV fluids, and labor hormones. Katie, my friend and intended mother of the baby I had been caring for 38 and a half weeks, was standing to my left, nervously awaiting what was to unfold. Her husband, Stephen, had not been permitted in the OR given the two guest limit. I could see in front of me a large curtain and several doctors and nurses scurrying about in surgical scrubs and masks. While months before I had nearly spit out my drink during office hours when a male grad student recited John 15, 13 upon learning of my surrogacy and therein compared me to Jesus. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for my friends. It wasn't lost on me that I was now lying down on a T-shaped operating table with my arms outstretched and strapped down in what some nurses have called the crucifix position. Of the many memories I have of the events surrounding my emergency C-section, one stands out above the rest. The moment when my ob gyn pulled the baby out and we all heard her cry. I remember closing my eyes, releasing a fresh surge of tears from relief, joy, and exhaustion, and thinking silently to myself, hot damn, we did this. I also remember sensing my doctor's hesitation as he held the baby girl and slowly moved toward me. He seemed uncertain, or perhaps he had simply forgotten to whom he should give her, my friend Katie or me, her surrogate. So I quickly exclaimed, Katie, give the baby to Katie, and then, and then uncharacteristically stuttered, Katie, hold your baby, to end his confusion by barking out orders of what was to be done. As my unconventional pregnancy came to an end, so did Katie and Stephen's 10-year saga of involuntary childlessness. Okay, so now anecdote number two. In the waning weeks of my third pregnancy, when my shape served as a telltale sign of my condition, I could no longer run into an acquaintance, colleague, or student without having an exchange that went something like this, or that would go something like this. Well, Grace or Dr. Gao, I didn't know you were expecting. When are you due? October 1st. Congrats. Do you know what you're having? Thanks. Yes, it's a girl. But here's the thing. I'm actually carrying my friend's baby, not my own. The eyes of whomever I was talking to would usually then widen with shock. After all, I was then 40 and a married, middle-class, Taiwanese-American tenured professor with two kids, hardly the stereotype of someone who becomes pregnant for others. How my conversation partners would then respond would vary. This is Dr. Monica Coleman, who was a previous lecturer. Um, 
Those would pay me some sort of compliment. How generous of you. That's amazing. What a gift. Others would struggle to process what they just heard. You mean you're a surrogate? I could tell that most were also curious whether the baby was genetically mine. The answer is no. Or how my unusual arrangement even came to me. Now that's a longer story. Many of my women interlocutors would first register surprise like the others and then imaginatively place themselves in a parallel position. They would blur out, blurt out, wow, I could never do that, before narrating how difficult their pregnancy, labor and delivery, or postpartum experiences had been, or why they just couldn't imagine undergoing all that it takes to birth a child into the world for someone else. Through these exchanges, I even came to learn something I hadn't known previously, how surrogacy had been a live option for some people I knew. Four women disclosed to me that they too had once contemplated carrying a child for a loved one, but ultimately did, didn't go through with it for one reason or another. A good friend with a school-aged child and a sad history of miscarriages reacted to my news in partial jest. Grace, I didn't know you were available, and still there are other conversations I could tell you about. My visibly pregnant body and one sentence mention of my carrying a baby for my friends had been enough to induct me into a society I had scarcely known existed. It was one where fertility problems were freely shared and where people found themselves strangely moved, even flooded with tears, upon hearing the scantest of details about our story. Years later, I came to learn that these reactions were par for the course. As Elizabeth Kane, America's first contractually paid traditional surrogate came to see, infertility isn't exactly cocktail party talk, but as soon as anyone finds out the details of my pregnancy, they feel free to tell me the most intimate details of their lives. Okay, so again, I'm deeply honored to be here as the 50th Antoinette Brown lecturer. And what I'm doing tonight is sharing my firsthand experiences with and scholarly reflections on a very controversial topic. Uh, so I've been told this lectureship is intended to bring distinguished women theologians to speak on concerns for women in ministry. Today, with infertility on the rise and with more same-sex couples wanting to head families, it is increasingly becoming a pastoral question of how to counsel folks who are exploring the paths to parenthood that might be available to them. So when I first agreed some eight years ago to carry my friend's baby, I couldn't have imagined that I'd soon be embarking on this research agenda. But I came to see that there was both scholarly, sorry, both considerable interest in and widespread concerns and misperceptions about collaborative reproduction. For some, surrogacy is primarily about wealthy celebrities outsourcing their pregnancies. For others, surrogacy is the stuff of dystopian nightmares. So as someone who identifies as a feminist and progressive Christian, I ultimately wrote my book in a way that engages those who are feminist but not necessarily Christian those who are Christian but not necessarily feminist, and those like me who claim both sets of identities. As a Christian ethicist, my book offers seven norms and principles to guide the formation of ethical surrogacy arrangements that are grounded upon the four traditional sources of moral wisdom, and that's Bible, tradition, reason, or secular sources of knowledge and experience. In my feminist and progressive Christian vision for surrogacy, we ultimately come to view women or other pregnancy capable people who bear children for others as persons who are embodying reproductive solidarity through their welcoming of new life in their wombs as a, sorry, out, out of a desire to assist parent hopefuls to do something they cannot do on their own. In addition, Rather than surrogates being stigmatized for their labor or the new parents feeling judged and shamed about their use of third-party reproduction, 
we come to accept not only plural ways that families can be expanded, but also that motherhood itself can be divided and shared across persons. That is, just as what has been called maternal multiplicity is already widely accepted and even embraced in plural cultures, um, when everyone knows and respects their place in a child's life, so it is my hope that it becomes no longer strange, even if it still remains uncommon, for a child to have a gestational and perhaps even genetic mother distinguishable, perhaps, from their primary parent. Indeed, we already have historical and contemporary precedents of one lactating mother helping another parent with either low or no milk supply to feed their child from her own body's labor. So I would love to be a part of a world where surrogacy becomes another way a pregnancy-capable person could embody reproductive generosity in a world where reproductive frustration and even oppression are unfortunately all the more common. So all of that is part of my progressive Christian vision. But because I can't possibly compress the full argument of my book, <laughs> in support of it in this one lecture, and because I have titled my talk, Can Surrogacy Be Feminist? How about Christian? I want to say more about two of the four sources of moral wisdom that's undergirding it. Okay, so let's begin with experience, since it is a connecting point between Christian ethics and feminist methodology. Following the work of philosophers L.A. Paul and Fiona Woolard, I contend that certain kinds of experiences, namely those of former surrogates like me and others who have had at least one pregnancy resulting in a live birth, which is a common prerequisite for surrogate motherhood, I believe these folks should be, these experiences should be regarded as epistemically transformative and thus carry greater normative weight in applied ethical debates involving pregnancy including any pregnancies undertaken for others. In taking the concept of epistemically transformative experiences seriously, I invite anyone ambivalent about or critical of surrogacy out of concern for the women involved to actually listen to the stories of those who have entered into these collaborative reproduction arrangements with others um, to learn how they ultimately fared. Indeed, we actually have over three decades of cross-cultural ethnographic and social scientific studies about women who've become pregnant for others. Parent hopefuls who have opted for this method of family ex uh, expansion and the surrogate-born children themselves. And I'll share some of these key findings with you tonight. Okay, so now in turning to another source of normativity, which is tradition, I should state, if it's not obvious by now, that I, as a Presbyterian laywoman, am clearly not operating out of a Catholic natural law tradition on matters pertaining to sex, gender, and family formation. Indeed, my point of departure is aligned with several mainline Protestant denominations that affirm that children are a good or end of marriage, but only for those who are uh, called to parenthood that both adoption and the conscientious use of IVF are paths infertile married couples could take when there is no other way for them to bear children, and that same-sex love, covenantal partnerships, and marriage are equally, uh, here we go, equally beneficial, equally beautiful, and as good as their opposite sex counterparts. I also stand in the tradition of the Presbyterian Church USA um, that has never condemned third-party reproduction like some other mainline denominations have. So, for instance, Episcopalians have. But as early as 1983, uh, the PCUSA USA Church has encouraged further study on the use of surrogates or donor gametes in family planning. So in making the case for the moral permissibility of surrogacy on feminist and progressive Christian grounds, the argumentative gap in the case of infertile married or covenantly partnered couples 
is how to move from the prior acceptance of, of use of IVF between the couple to the use of IVF involving a third party gestational surrogate. Now the case for same sex intended parents similarly requires the radical hospitality of another who will assist them, but begins with a different question, which is what does true marriage equality entail? Because if same sex couples are to head families, a third party must necessarily be involved, even if it is a birth mother in an adoption scenario. And since many mainline Protestant de denominations already affirm that children are a good or end of marriage for those who are called to parenting, and that adoption and IVF are both acceptable means for heterosexual married couples who cannot conceive naturally, it stands to reason that same-sex couples should be permitted to turn to adoption and use of ReproTech as well. Otherwise, I argue that these same denominations would be guilty of holding an untenable separate but equal position. So for these and other reasons, I have come to view surrogacy when ethically arranged as a one way uh, we could realize some feminist and progressive Christian aims. Still, I know that many feminists and progressives who share some of my commitments, for instance, about queer parenting, um, perhaps even some of you in this very audience uh, still feel ambivalent about surrogacy as a way forward. So what I wanna do now is turn to address three common fears about surrogacy that it's bad for women and thus incompatible with feminist or Christian values. Okay, so the first that I'll cover is about the widely assumed distress that surrogates, surrogates will undergo. The second is about the practice's purported implications for the abortion debate. And the third is that surrogacy impermissibly commodifies and exploits vulnerable women. Okay, so concern number one. When I served as Katie and Stephen's surrogate, hands down, the most common question asked of me by friends, colleagues, and strangers alike was a variation of the following question. Aren't you afraid you'll grow attached to the baby and not wanna give it up? And since childhood, many well-intentioned folks have continued to gently ask if it's painful for me to see the girl I bore being raised by someone else. And they've always been shocked when I say, not at all. In either case, the working assumption is that either the handover will prove instantly traumatizing because any birth mom would have grown attached to the baby while developing in utero, or that she would ultimately come to feel tremendous loss about separating from the child, you know, in the months and years after. So what accounts for this widespread belief in deep surrogate pain? One factor must be the belief in the maternal instinct that is purportedly present in all women, or at least all expectant ones. And this is the understanding that women naturally crave motherhood and will inevitably bond with the life growing inside of them when pregnant. So just as popular culture characterizes birth mothers in adoptions as grieving mightily and for a prolonged period of time after being compelled by their tragic circumstances to give up their child. This is the vision that popular culture has. So it's widely assumed that surrogates would anal analogously yearn for the baby they let go of because of their prior agreements or contracts prevented them from being able to keep them. So I suspect a little bit more controversially that just as women who have had abortions are commonly depicted as having made an agonizing decision even by those who wholeheartedly affirm their legal and moral right to have done so. So it is presumed that anyone who agrees to become pregnant for others could only sever that maternal fetal bond with great hardship. That the first well-publicized surrogacy cases in the US and the UK ended tragically at a time when the public was first becoming aware of this simultaneously age-old a newer way of bringing children into the world has further sealed in the public imaginary this belief that motherhood is the commonly desired goal of any pregnancy. 
In the mid-1980s, the world witnessed traditional surrogate Mary Beth Whitehead's anguished inability to cope following the birth and handover of so-called BBM. Across the Atlantic, Kim Cotton, the first traditional surrogate in the UK, was similarly devastated because she never got to meet the anonymous Swedish couple she was recruited to assist and because she had agreed to never contact baby Cotton post-birth. The media headlines about her suffering spurred legislation that in its essentials is still intact today. Surrogacy contracts there in the UK are unenforceable, commercials arrangements are forbidden, and the legal mother is and must be the woman who gave birth, regardless of any genetic connection or lack thereof, until and unless the courts determine six to 12 months later that it's in the child's best interest for parentage to be transferred elsewhere. So popular culture has also reinforced this trope of surrogate grief. I remember watching a story arc in the hit NBC sitcom Friends where one of the main characters, Phoebe, carries triplets for her brother and his wife. At one point, she asks her brother if she can keep one of the triplets, and after he declines, Phoebe shares a moment alone with the newborns and says the following, everyone said labor was the hardest thing I'd ever have to do, but they were wrong. This is. More recently, Celeste Ng's best-selling 2017 book, which was adapted for a TV miniseries, in 2020 contains a surrogacy gone wrong plot twist. It turns out that one of the two protagonists, Mia Warren, played by actress Carrie Washington, was once a traditional surrogate who couldn't bear the thought of partying with the baby once born. So she lied to the couple that she had miscarried and has been raising her daughter Pearl on the lamb ever since. Okay, so do surrogates actually, uh, Sorry, do surrogacies come at a high psychological cost for most women? In contrast to those early tragic court cases and fictional storylines, the scholarly literature shows the vast majority of surahmoms hand over the baby without incident, distress, or court battles. The radical feminists who are opposed to reproductive technology, defenders of Catholic social teaching on bioethics, conservative evangelicals like Southern Baptists and other critics have castigated the practice for asking too much of a woman to alienate herself from what she would naturally feel toward any child she carried in her womb. Countless surah moms, including me, report never needing to protect themselves from becoming too attached because there is no danger of bonding. Uh, so here's a slide showing some representative findings from four separate studies uh, drawn from Israel, the U.S., and Thailand. Um, and so you can just read them on, on, on your own. So in the U.K., the oldest surrogacy charity founded by the aforementioned Kim Cotton, Childlessness Overcome Through Surrogacy, estimates that 99% of the arrangements they have facilitated have brought a great deal of satisfaction to the people involved. And in an American Journal of Obstetrics, Obstetrics and Gynecology 2021 review essay found that the majority of research aimed at exploring surrogates' coping mechanisms during the relinquishment period unequivocally show feelings of joy, accomplishment, pride, and satisfaction. So instead of bonding with the developing life inside of them, Cross-cultural research has shown that many surrogates end up bonding with the intended parents instead. As British, British psychologist Olya B. A. van der Acker has seen from her clinical studies, many surrogates and commissioning couples develop a strong bond or friendship because both physical and emotional changes are relevant to both parties. They therefore get to know each other well and most keep in contact well after the arrangement has ended. In one of the most beautiful passages I have read about the bond that can form among gestational, genetic, and social mothers, Alexandra Kimball, uh, she's written this book below, The Seed. Um, uh, the, the Seed is subtitled Infertility and Feminist Issues. 
She writes about the intense feelings she felt both toward her newborn and her surrogate moments after her long-awaited son was born, and that's the passage I've reproduced here. Upon reflecting upon her experiences, Kimball acknowledges how she is forever conscious of the two stories every time she would either see her baby or interact with her surrogate or egg donor, both, of, both with whom she has stayed in contact. So she writes, in one story, she had to have other women help me make my baby. How sad. In the other, she got to have a baby with other women. Pretty cool. So in sum, when we insist upon this trope of surrogate pain, even after numerous studies have found it to be the rare exception, not the norm, we risk ignoring what women themselves are telling us. That is, we substitute our preconceived notions of what surrogacy is or must be like for their own accounts of their own experiences. Okay, so that's number one. Concern number two is about eroding bodily autonomy and adversely affecting the abortion debate. So the second fear is that the very signing of surrogacy contracts would lead to a curtailing of women's rights. So when reflecting on baby M in 1987, and here I'm just gonna flag 1987 is obviously post Roe pre Dobbs, right? Um, Feminist essayist Katha Pollitt noted the way surrogacy could erode women's power and autonomy. So she writes, right now a man cannot legally control the conduct of a woman pregnant by him. He cannot force her to have an abortion or not have one, to manage her pregnancy and delivery as he thinks best, or to submit to fetal surgery or a C-section. Nor can he sue her if, through what he considers to be negligence, she miscarries or produces a defective baby. A maternity contract could give a man all of these powers except possibly the power to compel abortion. All right, so that was in 1987. And decades later, you have none other than feminist icon Gloria Steinem, who voiced very, very similar concerns in her open letter in June 2019 calling upon the then governor of New York not to legalize commercial surrogacy. She gave a number of reasons, but the one I'm focusing on now is that it undermines women's control over their bodies when their rights over the fetus are greatly curtailed and they, they lose all rights to the baby. And so for the record, she was not successful. New York, after multiple decades, has uh, decriminalized commercial surrogacy. So how might we respond to these feminist concerns. Um, and basically, I'm saying, well, look, at, in an era where there's neither the full realization of reproductive justice, nor the security of an individual's rights to pregnancy termination, we must acknowledge that these feminist fears are not unwarranted. We should thus insist upon certain safeguards particularly the legal right for all pregnant persons, including those who become pregnant for others, to retain medical decision-making in all aspects of their prenatal care. And that includes termination or selective reduction. So in cases of real or potential conflict about managing, continuing on, or terminating a surrogate pregnancy, basically everyone needs to remember that the ultimate moral and legal decision-making prerogative rests with the pregnant person who is the true patient. After all, the reproductive justice framework denounces a coerced abortion or a coerced fetal reduction just as much as it decries a coerced pregnancy. As philosophers Ruth Walker and Lizelle Van Zyl eloquently have concluded in their article, and they talk about you know, what happens when you have a fetal you know, abnormality, who's gonna make the call, they conclude the following. The right to decide whether to terminate a pregnancy does not depend on a genetic relationship between mother and fetus, nor is it based on in the intention or duty to raise that child. Rather, it is grounded in the right to bodily integrity. Hence, in non-surrogate pregnancies, a woman's spouse or partner does not have a right to demand or permit abortion, even if he is the genetic and would-be social parent. 
In the same way, the surrogate's right to decide whether to undergo an abortion is based on her status as a pregnant woman, regardless of the genetic or intended social relationship to the fetus. So it's worth noting that some jurisdictions follow the guidance from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, and so they've inserted provisions uh, in, their juris in their legislation specifically protecting each surrogate's rights on this score. Now, in cases where the law is unclear, clauses in surrogacy contracts covering selective reduction or pregnancy termination, at least in the US, have not been interpreted as legally enforceable. Judith Darr, who is chairman of the ASRM Ethics Committee, acknowledges this legal gray area, but does not believe a US court would ever direct a surrogate to undergo the procedure without her consent. Okay, so now we move to our third concern, and this is um, front and center for many people, which is that surrogacy as a practice or an industry exploits and commodifies women's reproductive capacities. Um, so the fear here is that the industry has created the very conditions for more affluent couples to induce and therein exploit poorer and less educated women to undertake significant medical and psychological risks on their behalf. As buttressed by those tragic 1980s landmark cases in popular culture, the public still generally believes that no one would willingly become pregnant with a stranger by either artificial insemination or the more cumbersome IVF embryo transfer process and then give up the child unless they were desperate for money or pathological. So some opponents of commercial surrogacy bundle their consternation about class with race, particularly when they assume that the parent hopefuls would be primarily white or from the developed Western countries, and the persons they would hire would be disproportionately of color or from the global south. So after noting the ways in which the concept of surrogacy of a person or group taking on the responsibilities that belong to someone else has been a negative force in African American women's lives throughout all of US history from slavery up to the present time, Pioneering womanist theologian Dolores Williams expressed fears that reproductive surrogacy would inflame already tense race relations. Uh, so in this passage I have reproduced here, will the law legitimate surrogacy to the point that black women's ovaries are targeted for use by groups more powerful than, black, uh, than poor black women? Will surrogacy become such a common practice in wealthy women's experiences that laws are established to regulate it, but laws that work to the advantage of the wealthy and the disadvantage of the poor? Will poverty pressure poor black women to rent their bodies out as incubators for wealthier women unable to birth children? Are American women stepping into an age of reproduction control so rigid that women will be set against each other like Hagar and Sarah? Will the operation of certain reproductive technologies acting in white women's favor put even more strain upon the already strained relation between black and white women? Right. So, you know, this this concern, you know, it, it has been longstanding. Okay, uh, but to be clear, for some critics of surrogacy, the primary concern is not exploitation in terms of underpayment, like I need more money to do this job. The primary concern is the very fact that payment is being introduced into the equation, right? So the deeper concern is about commodification, not uh, just about exploitation. In some cases, critics will combine the two. So for instance, the European Parliament uh, since 2015 has supported the prohibition of commercial surrogacy on the grounds that it undermines the human dignity of the woman to treat her body and its reproductive functions as a commodity. And following Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, they put out some statements. They also talked about um, the vulnerable state that Ukrainian surrogates were in. And th this was real. There were WAPO articles about intended parents, you know, trying to get kids and Ukrainians fleeing for their, you know, so this is a, a real concern. Okay, 
So in turning now to a response, we begin with two frank concessions. So the first is that compensated surrogacies between persons who were previously strangers to one another, it, those two create conditions not normally present in unmunerated surrogacies between family members or friends. So all you gotta do is watch reality TV. And you know that if you introduce money, right, people will do things that they might not otherwise do, and they will minimize the risks that they might incur. So yes, we, we, we need to acknowledge that. Okay. So fortunately, there is little evidence that the indigent in the U.S. are actually being recruited become, to become pregnant for others. And that is because fertility clinics regularly screen out individuals on welfare or public assistance. A known correlation exists between poverty and poor health, rendering underprivileged persons undesirable surrogacy candidates. And because commissioning parents do not want to feel like they must support the surrogate financially. So of course, screening norms are going to vary from clinic to clinic and of course across the world so what is generally the case in the US doesn't necessarily hold across the world. I was basically trying to explain this to, to people. To be a surrogate, it's not like being a drug mule, right? Where all you have to do is like, you know, have a cavity to hold the drugs. Like to, be, to, to actually have a good outcome, a healthy pregnancy, you yourself have to be healthy, right? So it is not in the intended parent's best interest to to pick people who are in poor health, who, are ha who have low income, who don't have stable environments, right? So it's the fear that people have of like, you know, the, the, the Margaret Atwood type of thing, it, it, it is not, the, the incentive structure doesn't work that way. Again, surrogates, not like drug meals, right? Okay. Okay, so, uh, okay, so now the second concession we must make is that we cannot conclusively verify or put to rest the public's fears that, fears that surrogacy perpetuates racial inequities or exasperates racial tensions. And this is because there are no federal or international reporting requirements about the racial or socioeconomic status of the parties involved, and because fertility clinics only selectively self-report their clients' demographics, and also because many in the independent arrangements are formed outside of agency matches. Now, having said that, in many empirical studies on intrastate surrogacy arrangements in several Western contexts, you should know that white people are overrepresented on both sides of the equation. They're overrepresented as surrogates, they're overrepresented as intended parents. So if we're thinking about surrogacy in racially binary ways, uh, you might be missing some things. You know, something I shared to, with the luncheon crowd is that, so I, I'm from California. California is, is, is believed to be the surrogacy capital of the world. The top sending country of intended parents to California is now China. Chinese couples prefer to hire white surrogates. So you have Asian bodies, right, <laughs> exactly, like hiring, so, so the, the, this racial, so that's not to say that the other thing doesn't happen, white, wealthy people going to Southeast Asia or whatever, but only that it's just one piece of the picture. The picture is actually much more complex. All right, so in my book, I offer more thorough explanations of four key reasons why surrogate compensation could be judged morally permissible and even good and thus in women's best interests. So I'm just gonna sketch them out here, and I'd be happy to elaborate upon these points in, in the Q&A if interested. Okay, so the first is tied to an important understanding in feminist ethics, that one can simultaneously seek to assist others and serve oneself in the process. Women across the world who undertake pregnancies for themselves often report a mixture of self and other regarding reasons. They are moved by the pain and sadness of others' struggles with infertility. They find their own identities as mothers very important to them. They either enjoy pregnancy or at least do not find it especially difficult or cumbersome. And they believe they could put the money they would earn to good use 
and thus they want to help people become first-time parents. Now, I argue that we accept the commingling of other regard and self-regard in other lines of work. So, for instance, most people believe that public school teachers or nurses should be paid a decent wage and that they might have selected their line of work for several reasons, one being that they enjoy helping people. So then why are we so quick to assume that women who receive compensation above expenses when bearing children for others would only or primarily be doing it for profit when we clearly accept the, the mixture of self and other regard in other lines of work, again, especially in the so-called helping professions. So that's um, point number one. Okay, the second reason is connected to the importance of avoiding paternalism and trusting that all persons can conscientiously and ethically consent to work under risky or hazardous conditions for money. Where, for instance, is the public outcry about the safety and well-being of workers in the logging or commercial fishing industries, given that they consistently rank among the most dangerous jobs in the US? Or, if a critic is prepared to say that a poor or working class woman could not reasonably consent to surrogacy because it would be only their lower economic standing or need for money driving their uh, decision, then what would be preventing that same critic from saying, well, if she can't consent to surrogacy, she can't consent to anything. She can't consent to working in farming. She can't consent to working in a factory, right? If it's the poverty driving one decision, surely it's gonna be the poverty driving another. And I'm, I'm not prepared to say if you are a poor person, you do not know how to exercise agency in making these decisions. Okay, now in transnational contexts, the record has admittedly been mixed. There are and have been documented cases where the standard of informed consent has not been met um, because let's say, you know, there, there's been anthologies where people have talked about surrogates in various countries, Mexico, Nepal, India, where the women were told, you're gonna have a C-section and it'll be medically better for you. But in fact, no, what they're trying to do is arrange cross-border travel, right? Because these parents who are in England or Canada or whatever, they don't want to just get the call like, oh, you know, water broke, right? They want to plan it. So that's clearly not the conditions of informed consent if you're being deceived about what's in your best interest. Um, okay, so we acknowledge that. And then on the other side, I would say, as post-colonial feminists uh, have repeatedly warned, there are dangers in too quickly assuming that all poor women from the global south are invariably powerless victims in need of aid. Uh, there have been some qualitative uh, research done in three Indian cities, Mumbai, New Delhi, and Chennai in 2013 and 2014, where they found that the majority of their subjects who were previously in wage paid employment, they actually preferred surrogacy to their previous job. It was better paid, it had better working conditions, since working late and reaching home late in their other jobs was frowned upon in their neighborhood and led to harassment or a bad reputation, and might even have been less dangerous than other wage labor available for them. So this data, again, there are several studies and there are other studies that say other things, um, they basically, the, the hypothesis that it's an economic non-choice cannot be sustained when you have interviews with people saying, actually, I've had options and this is the one I, I want to do. Okay, to the third reason um, why it shouldn't invariably be frowned upon is to avoid what's been called the tyranny of the gift. And this is a term that comes up in organ donation. This is a situation where, you know, let's say you receive a much needed organ from a living donor who is a family member or friend and you are made to feel endlessly indebted to them because of it. You know, so like, you know, someone gives you your kidney and then you go out drinking and they're like, oh, two drinks, huh? You know, <laughs> that type of thing, right? You're, you know, you feel indebted to them, you feel like you're being monitored. Okay, um, the gift, uh, as per this phenomenon, the gift the recipient has received from the donor is so extraordinary that it is inherently unreciprocal. It has no physical or symbolic equivalent as a consequence, the giver, the receiver, and the families may feel themselves locked in a creditor-debtor vise that binds them to each other in a mutually fettering way. 
So in my own case, Katie and Stephen, I'll, I'll say this. So again, no, I was not paid. I, this was a, a surrogacy of love. But they took every opportunity they could. When I was going through IVF, when I was pregnant with their child, when I was covering, recovering postpartum, when I was providing breast milk for the child, to give me a gift, like random holidays, like Arbor Day, or like, you know, just like whatever occasion, here's a gift, Grace, you know, we love you, we're so grateful. So my experience of being on the receiving end of these copious gifts has given me some insight into the real desire among some intended parents. They want to see if they can try to equalize the exchange, knowing that they can't, but they want to try so they don't feel like the surrogate is endlessly giving, they are also giving something of value. Okay, so that's number three. And the fourth and final reason um, why compensated surrogacies uh, ought not to be, you know, too court prohibited is to meet the standards of fairness and justice in contexts where persons involved in other aspects of assisted reproduction are already entitled to receive compensation if they seek it. So the larger point I want to make here is that this conventional distinction between altruistic and commercial surrogacy is it's ultimately misleading because many commercial surrogates report a combination of self-interested and other regarding reasons, and also altruistic surrogacies like mine take place in the commercial landscape, right? So in my case, everybody was paid for their services except for me. The attorneys who drew up our contracts, the psychologists who hired we hired to evaluate us, the reproductive endocrinologists and staff at the fertility clinic. So it's one thing to say I didn't seek payment. It's another thing to pass a law that says you cannot receive it, right? And that would be contextually problematic, especially if you're already compensating for gametes or you know these other things. Okay. All right. So I have come to my conclusion. I've I've come to see that many in society do not only presume it must be psychologically torturous for a woman to hand over the child she has carried uh, in her womb to others to raise, but they actively actually want that to be the case, lest their belief in the solidity of maternal love be shaken. As Australia's first intended mother and second known uh, intended mother in the world wisely observed, Part of the horror inspired by surrogacy is a fear of a world in which the mother-child bond is fragile and transient, a world in which a mother can give away her baby. Surrogacy as a practice threatens public confidence in the naturalness of motherhood and the universality of the maternal instinct. But just as the myth of abortion regret persists, even though many studies have found that the majority of persons who terminate their pregnancies feel relief after the fact and affirm even years later that it was the right decision for them to have made. So I and other surrogates must gently correct people when they assume all sorts of things about whatever painful loss that we must have experienced. Now having said that, there are many ways where a surrogacy arrangement could go horribly wrong. But my hope is that if pursued consciously and ethically, and so in my book, I offer these seven norms, and you know, these are not things I impact here, um, that surrogacy could not only be morally justifiable from the standpoint of feminist and progressive Christian values, but also a thing of beauty. Thank you so much. Personal experience. You know, your presentation reminded me of the book that I read about, you know, several decades ago. <laughs> uh, Korean feminist theologian, uh, Jung Hyun Kyung, mm -hmm. uh, she wrote the book, Struggle to be the Sun. And in that book, she shared her experience. She was, she is the uh, surrogated child. Oh. 
Wow. And then, you know, your presentation, you know, <laughs> is from, from uh, the surrogate mother's perspective. Mm -hmm. Then how about surrogate the child's perspective? Are there any researches you know, about that? Yes. And then just curious. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that. I, I don't remember that detail from that book, so that's so interesting. I'm, I want to read it again. We have, at this point, about two decades. So we, we know what these kids feel up to about age 20. But we don't know what 50-year-old kids feel like because surrogacy as a contemporary thing only started to, you know, in the 1980s. Um, and in my book, I talk about various findings. Uh, one is that disclosure, like just like adoption, always is in the best interest of the child. And actually, so is an ongoing relationship between surrogate mother and parents and child. But yeah. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Um, I think I'm wondering partially perhaps how we might complicate this in the sense that you name you know, all of the majority of the studies and the ways in which there are like the positive sides of it, but I wonder what we do even with like the outlier, like the horror mm -hmm. stories yeah. of them mm -hmm. um, and how we kind of fold that into the narrative carefully. Yes. Um, without skewing too far one way or too far the other way and creating an odd sense of erasure like in either direction? Absolutely, yeah. So for instance, not everyone who pursues IVF ends up with the child. Not every surrogate ar you know, arrangement yields a positive outcome. There are tragic stories, there's heartbreak. Um, there are, to so in, in the book I talk about the special concern about cross-border surrogacies depending on the interaction between two nations, if they have conflicting laws, you could have total disaster cases of a child being born legally stateless and legally parentless. Because one place says, no, birth mom is mom. Another person says, right, another. So absolutely <laughs> there are disaster cases. And I think you're right, we need to hold them together. Why are Asian families seeking white <laughs> surrogates? It's, yeah, so I, I'll say two things. So for, it's, for some, it's a status thing. And it's, it's, for some, it's a belief that white women are healthier. Um, but having said that, there is also a whole industry of Chinese-speaking surrogates who are themselves usually ethnically Chinese. So reproductive tourism is a thing. Um, in the book, I talk about the difference between reproductive tourism and being a reproductive exile. So someone like a Chinese person who may be, I mean, if you had this one child policy up until 2013 and then only you were starting to phase it out, even if you're a person of wealth, there's a sense in which you're an exile, right? You're not just trying to get a tan in the Bahamas, right? Mm -hmm. I talk about Cristiano Ronaldo, so I, I, I don't really care about soccer, but my <laughs> nephew is really into him, and he's had uh, three kids via surrogacy before his partner and, and his bio kids. Mm -hmm. um, but he's from Portugal, and Portugal did not allow surrogacy. So is he a tourist or is he an exile, right? Mm -hmm. Appreciate your lecture, thank you for that. Um, I couldn't help but my mind raced to Phyllis Tribble who taught us that the Hebrew word for compassion is the word for womb. Hmm. And she argues that God is the compassionate God consistently throughout scriptures. So she argues that God is womish um, and calls us into a womish existence of inviting people into spaces that, that give life. So I'm just sort of intrigued about if you would willing to be willing to share a little bit about your own spiritual journey, uh, your own journey with God. Uh, oh. what, what, what happened with you throughout this journey of surrogacy? Uh, what happened with me spiritually with God? I, um, you know how it's very popular for people to be spiritual but not religious? 
I am the opposite. I'm religious, but not spiritual. So <laughs> I don't know if I had like deep epiphanies or, um, but I will say this, there's a, I was struck in reading these accounts by women, you know, on discussion boards or whatever, who, whether they were women or they were the intended parents, they really felt like they had like broken the laws of nature, even if they were ostensibly secular. And I think because I'm Presbyterian, I just had zero of that. I had zero guilt that I had done something to violate the way things ought to be. I think that's my best answer to you. Okay. Well, thank you all so very much. Will you please join us? Thank you. Thank you.